The 1980s has become synonymous with the action figure and cartoon tie-in, with many of the most popular toy lines of the decade having accompanying cartoons airing on Saturday morning television. These cartoons were used to entertain kids with the mythology behind each toy concept, but their main purpose was to help boost sales of the action figures. Even with this overt advertising agenda, many of these toy lines and cartoons were developed with a genuine passion and tender care that nurtured these concepts into beloved pop culture mainstays, and the modern day nostalgia surrounding these brands is perfectly understandable. However, one such brand stands out to me as being nothing more than a commercial opportunity that was thrust upon the children of the 80s with a level of care akin to Darth Vader's parenting skills, and I, for one, wasn't buying into it. Hello toy fans, my name is Tony and welcome to an Analog Toys special feature, the origin of Hasbro's Transformers. In 1984, American toy company Hasbro introduced a new toy line to kids that ended up becoming one of its defining brands. These new toys were robots that could change into vehicles, weapons and other equipment, and they proved to be a huge success. The Transformers, more than meets the eye. Transformers from Hasbro. But where did this idea for transforming robot toys originate? Unlike G.I. Joe and Masters of the Universe, which were concepts developed by their creator companies, Transformers was a mishmash of different toy lines licensed out of Japan. At the 1983 Tokyo Toy Fair, Hasbro approached Japanese toy company Takara, wanting to license two of their most popular toy lines, Diaclone and Microchange. The Diaclone toy line featured a series of vehicles such as cars, jets and trucks that could change into futuristic robots while the microchange toy line took everyday objects such as cassette recorders, cameras and guns that could also transform into robots. In 1984, Hasbro licensed these two toy lines and released them in the US under the unifying banner brand, Transformers. Hasbro had had great success marketing their G.I. Joe brand in comics and cartoons, so they created similar plans for the Transformers. Writers Jim Shooter and Dennis O'Neill were hired to create the Transformers comic backstory, and Sumbo Productions was brought on board to produce the Transformers cartoon that first aired in September 1984. The story follows the heroic Autobots led by Optimus Prime and the evil Decepticons led by Megatron as they leave their homeworld of Cybertron in search of new energy sources, only to crash land on Earth where they remained entombed and offline for four million years. Awaking in the present day, the Decepticons set about pillaging the energy sources of Earth, while the Autobots attempt to protect the new world on which they find themselves. If this backstory seems a little ridiculous, it doesn't really matter. All you need to remember is that there are good Transformers and there are bad Transformers and they fight each other. And apart from that, there's not much of a plot. I also get the distinct impression that the writers didn't particularly care much either. They just needed to sell Hasbro's toys and even the most hastily thrown together and poorly animated cartoon would do. A similar cartoon that aired in the early 80s, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe was also used to promote an accompanying toy line. However, Unlike Sunbow's Transformers, Filmation took great care with the concept and was able to turn the Masters of the Universe cartoon into a fantasy fairy tale that had a genuine heart and soul. By now, I'm sure you've realised that I'm not a Transformers fan, but that wasn't always the case. In 1984, I was seven years old and I clearly remember the Transformers craze that swept across the UK. I tuned into the cartoon just like everybody else 
and harassed my parents for months until I got Optimus Prime and Megatron for Christmas. But the appeal of these toys wore off pretty quickly. In order to fully understand the scale of the problem with Transformers, you only need to look at the scale of the toys. When in their robot mode, Optimus Prime and Megatron aren't exactly the same scale, but imagination can get you through. It's once they transform into their disguise mode that everything goes wrong. One is a German pistol and the other is a truck. And they're about the same size. It makes no bloody sense. I understand that to be invested in the concept of transforming robots takes a good degree of imagination. But the lack of any explanation behind this bizarre problem with the scale of the characters leaves us with a storyline that's totally devoid of logic. And even as a seven-year-old child, this always bothered me. When I was a kid, I did enjoy the Megatron toy, but mostly I just used it in its gun mode, which was pretty cool. But I found the robot mode to be a clunky disappointment with horrendous articulation that barely resembled the character depicted in the cartoon. Strangely enough, the original Japanese version of Megatron was based on the spy pistol in the classic 60s TV show, The Man From UNCLE. But quite why that show proved to be popular enough to adapt into a Japanese toy line remains a mystery. As a child, I always treated my toys with the utmost care. My parents insisted on it. But I can still remember how angry my dad got when he realised Megatron had broken only a few days after Christmas. Because these were, after all, relatively expensive toys when compared with other brands. But what hope was there for me? I would soon realise that the entire range of Transformer toys were plagued with this issue of fragility, and they easily broke even under the gentlest of play conditions. Way to go, Hasbro. The other glaring issue that I couldn't get past is highlighted in the design for Hasbro's Optimus Prime toy. While the action figure itself is one of the better looking when transformed in robot mode, it was his trailer that transformed into a headquarters that I always found weird. If Optimus Prime is a sentient being, why did his headquarters have a small vehicle and various cockpit seats scattered around the interior? Once again, it made no sense. Even at the age of seven, I always suspected that this toy was used to accommodate smaller pilot figures. But it wasn't until I was older and I was able to research the Transformers line that I found out my hunch was right on the money. Optimus Prime was originally entitled Battle Convoy and had come from Takara's Diaclone line of transforming toys. The vehicles released into the Diaclone range all came with miniature Diaclone driver figures who piloted both the vehicles and the robots that they transformed into. This obviously didn't fit in with the new Transformers backstory, so when Hasbro released the toy into the US marketplace, the small Diaclone driver figures were removed from the toy package, with no explanation given. It's quite clear to me that Hasbro put zero effort into this toy line. They employed both Marvel Comics and Sunbro Productions to peddle this new plastic crap to kids. But after my experiences with my first two Transformers toys, I wasn't buying into it anymore. And I'm glad I checked out when I did. In 1986, Transformers the movie was released in theatres, and although I was no longer among the Transformers faithful, I was aware that many of my childhood friends were really looking forward to a feature-length adventure with their favourite characters. That was, until they saw almost all their favourite Transformers slaughtered within the first few minutes of the film. Can you imagine how an audience would react if Luke Skywalker died in the opening scene of The Empire Strikes Back? There would be outrage. But that's effectively what Hasbro did with the Transformers movie. They killed off Optimus Prime, who is arguably the most popular heroic Transformers character. And it's not like the writers were just trying to raise the stakes of the story. You can do that by putting one or two of the key characters in jeopardy. Like when Han Solo was frozen in Carbonite. No, Hasbro's sole intention was to unceremoniously wipe out the entire first wave of Transformers toys in order to force kids into buying all the new Transformers junk they were pushing into toy stores. It was more than meets the eye. It was corporate greed in disguise. I could never cover the Transformers toy line in one of my Toy Histories episodes, because I simply don't collect Transformers toys. I have Optimus Prime and Megatron in my collection, but this is simply because these were the two Transformers I had when I was a kid. And I do also recognise that they're probably the most iconic Transformers of the 1980s. One day, I would also like to acquire the Dinobot Slag, because I do remember having him when I was a child, 
but I think the reason I got him was more to do with the fact that the Triceratops was my favourite dinosaur, as opposed to any real desire to have more transforming robot toys in my childhood collection. In my honest opinion, I think the original Takara toys were a real innovation that showed true potential, and with their combination of plastic, die-cast metal and real rubber components, they made some truly beautiful toys. It's just such a terrible shame that Hasbro concocted such a bizarre backstory and ruined the entire franchise. Porsche 935 Turbo の power と car robot のメカがドッキング。エンジン回転をレッドゾーンに上げて、機関ボディが駆け抜けた。今君の手にカーロボットポルシェ935ターボ。